Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. Today, we have Rosemary Johns, the author of Vampire Huntress from the United Kingdom by Skype. So if you love vampires, you're going to love meeting this author. Hi, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. Oh, my pleasure. So modern day London is invaded by angels and vampires. But the question with your series is who's really good and who's really bad <laughs> out of that mix? So can you tell us how you came into this series? Well, I always like writing about rebels and anti-heroes. Um, and I wanted to write a series where you had an anti-heroine as the lead, because that's something that's not written about very much. And I wanted a lead who was half vampire and half angel, and that's Violet, who's the main character. And she's an anti-heroine as well. Um, and she doesn't know that because she's been abandoned in modern London, and she's an orphan, and she's been raised amongst the humans before she comes into these monstrous powers. So the whole series is about the journey that she goes on to, goes into in this supernatural world. So the idea was to allow the supernaturals to have their own voice. So there's this whole world, this whole supernatural world alongside the humans. It's fantastic. So you've made first runner up in the best fantasy book of 2018 for Reality Bites Book Awards and also the USA Today's best selling list. That's amazing. How long have you been writing? <laughs> I've been writing a long time, actually, um, not necessarily novels. So I've been writing novels since 2016. My first series was Rebel Vampires. So I write the Rebel verse, like the Rebel universe. Um, and the first series, which was Rebel Vampires, was like the ultimate British male <laughs> anti-hero. Um, so she's the female one. And the first series was the male one, who was called Light. Uh, and that was giving him the voice so that he wasn't, uh, you didn't just have vampires being the romantic sidekick, the British ones being the sidekick or being the romantic lead. They actually got to be like, you know, the uh, the uh, lead for once in their own voice. So that was my first series. And this is a second one. But I've been writing before that I was a playwright. Um, and I was also a traditional short story writer. And I've been doing that. My very first short story was professionally published when I was 14. My parents sent off as if I was an adult. Um, so I've been doing it for a long time. But what's been exciting for me is the move into doing novels and being able to write what I'm really passionate about. Um, and that's really being allowed, being people who are a little bit outcasts or a little bit misfits or a little bit rebels and being able to get them to tell their own stories and become heroes, but in their own way. Wow, the detail is great. So the places in London that are depicted in the series, are those real places? They are real places. Um, my dad's a Londoner, and I'm really passionate about showing London as it truly is today. So often you get a sort of Downton Abbey concept. <laughs> <laughs> of, of England or you get maybe a kind of East End concept um, or you get an idea of London as it was a long time ago not as it actually is right now mm -hmm. and my husband is also a police officer so I kind of get his perspective on things and I, I get that I really want to show the parts of London or the, the side of London that maybe isn't shown very often um, so yeah all the places um, the cemetery <laughs> that they go into that's real um and hackney 
that's that's a really real depiction of how Hackney is. So that was really, I mean, Utopia Estate, which is the main estate, isn't real. Mm -hmm. um, because that would be really a naughty, I think, of me if I had taken an estate <laughs> uh, where that's the main estate where she grows up on and based it. But it's based on real estates that there are. So the estate that the real action where the where the vampires and angels fight, and I don't want to give spoilers, but where they fight and where Violet uh, grows up on, um, that's an estate that's an imaginary estate, but it's based on real estates that there are. But it was as close as I could get. But when you when you hear uh, the streets that she's walking along or all the others, they're, they're all real places, yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. It really seemed like real places, especially if you look them up while you were waiting to try and engage. Yeah. And it just made it really come to life. So how many books are in this series? So it's five books. Five. And five. Um, and there's actually a spin-off series from it. So the next series is a spin-off series from it. So there are char characters in this will go on into other series. Um, but this series is it's five books and over it the great thing with an anti-heroine is that they go on a really large journey and a real big you've got real big character development so they start off she starts off not really knowing how to love or not knowing how to trust because she's come from this really difficult background um, and she kind of learns over that five five book series um, about sacrifice and what true love is and and how to trust and how to create her own family um and i at the same time you know she i get to write these really thrilling worlds because there's a book set in angel world and there's a book set in the underworld which is something i've always wanted to write but it's very very different than you'd imagine the underworld um it's set oh, I don't, okay spoiler so i don't want to say where it's set but it's set somewhere very special in london that i've always wanted to set something um there's a uh, there's one set in uh, the legion of the phoenix which is like the most different magical academy than you could imagine which is angelic mages um and then in the final book it's finally in the realm of the gods so it's kind of she's gone from orphan abandoned in london amongst the humans on this huge arc and that's what's been most exciting about this series. Wow. There really is a lot of trust issues going on between the characters at the beginning of book one. Is book five done already? Has book it been... five is done. It's been just my latest release. Oh. So it's just come out. So yes, yeah, so the series is complete. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Because you're always waiting for the next book once you read the first <laughs> one. So I can't wait. Wow. So you grew up as a fantasy and myth fanatic in Oxford. Absolutely. Tell me about that. I think Oxford is a fantastic place if you are. <laughs> We're just from, you know, Tolkien and, and Lewis Carroll. And um, my parents, one of my earliest memories is my parents had just a bookcase that was just full of fantasy books and sci-fi books. And they didn't say this is what you read at this age. It was just you know, ha have added these adult books for just there and you know, we're just allowed to read it. So it's it's uh, it's a place that is full of fantasy authors. Um, and so I just grew up reading it and I grew up writing it. Um, and my first, that's what my first short story was. So um, I was always really into it and really into how you can have a original take or an original twist on a myth. Because that's what really interests me is how you take something that that is originally there that we all know, but how how can you do something that 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 twists that idea and that does something original on it? So I'm I'm really into that and I always have been. Well, can you give an example of a legend that you've twisted into one of your series, or at least into the Rebel Angel series? It's very difficult to do that without spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, that's fine. Okay, but, but I could, okay, I'd say for okay, so Rebel Angels is about vampires and it's about um it's about vampires and it's about angels. But vampires are not what you think they are. So we call them vampires as humans, but 
um, they aren't vampires by, <laughs> but they are vampires. They aren't as we'd imagine them. So um, just not even simple things about methods of, of whether they can go out in sunlight or methods of how you kill them and all these simple things. So I always like, I love world building and I love thinking through the logic of everything, but they, are, they aren't vampires at all. But as they've come to be seen as vampires, that's where the myth has come. Um, and also with angels, you think, oh, these oh, lovely sweet angels on clouds and they're all going to come and help us. Well, no, they're righteous. They're not good. They're righteous. Um, they've got violet eyes. They've got violet wings. Um, and the other ones have got grey wings. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Um, and the angel world, once you get to the angel world, all I'll say is a tagline on it is that angel world is no heaven. <laughs> it is a scary place. Maybe like and a purgatory. The, yeah. And one of the things I wanted to write is a matriarchy. So one of the things I wanted to write was, well, what, what would it, would it really be so amazing if women were in charge and women had power? Is power always corrupting? Mm -hmm. And again, this, this myth and concept of, of, of heaven with all male power, angels having the power and that concept and it, my it, it's not a, it's not religious again that thing of um angels being a religious thing they're creatures they are beings simply with power again it's taking that myth and it's twisting it and in the second book which is an angel world the female angels are uh glories the male ones are wings called wings and the female ones have the power so again, it's just it's 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 looking at it and thinking, how can I twist it? How can I write something that's a real original take on it, and then make something interesting and fun and sexy and thrilling and everything else that comes comes oh, it's along with definitely it? Definitely all of that. It's sexy. It's thrilling. It has all of those elements, and it will keep you awake for hours because you <laughs> just like oh, one more chapter. Wait. <laughs> Good. <laughs> No, I loved it. It was so much fun to read and follow through, and it just had a great flow to it. So growing up, which legend intrigued you the most that drew um, on your creativeness? Vampires. Vampires? It was vampires. Is um, vampires I, a big deal in England? Vampires were a huge deal Bram, with Bram Stoker. Bram Stoker's um, Dracula. Uh, it was is a huge thing. Was a huge thing when I was growing up. Um, obviously, he's Irish, so just and I know he's Irish. I'm part Irish. Um, we, one of my main well, in the first book, my main um, angel is Irish. Um, he's called Rebel, <laughs> and I'm part Irish, so that was one of the reasons for that. Um, and uh, vampires are a big thing, and some back to some of the original legends but it was for me i wanted to research and go back to to the where it came from where the original myths came from and back to how actually they can be pretty frightening you know back you know <laughs> and they are frightening as well as the positive sides you know that that the mixed sides of that and um i remember when i was at primary school we were all allowed to do a project on something we wanted to do and i wanted to do vampires and I wasn't allowed to. I'd actually done it all. I got it all ready to present the whole thing. And my teacher didn't allow me to. <laughs> really? How old were you? Yeah. I think I was about seven or eight. Wow. And <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, a, it was just, you know, it was a history. It was a history of where it had all come from. And that, that's probably what spurred me on in a rebellious fashion to be so interested in it. Probably. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but whenever think, you hear no, you always have. Whenever to you hear no, whenever you hear that something is taboo, that's it, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. What other elements do you draw from England, the countryside, the city itself, into the stories? Um, I have, I'm, I absolutely love um, Britain, um, and as a British author, I. I think this comes across in my books. As a British author, I really wanted to write something that was um, that was properly British, and that had um, 
for this series and for the last series that had uh, British leads in it, that had really good and strong British settings, um, that had characters who were from different parts of Britain. So I have Scottish, I have Welsh, I have Irish, um, and and that had uh, London at their centre, which they do, and have uh, different sides to England that you don't always see, um, and that had some language in it that you don't necessarily always hear, and that would properly immerse in the culture as well. Um, and I I have a sort of quite a strong sense of heritage. That was really important. But I also thought that I've got I'm very passionate about. Um, choice and freedom and diversity and actually those are really strong things here in Britain and that was they so I thought they're things I think that feed into the book a lot. Definitely. So where do you travel to that influences you in writing these stories? Um, I have a lot of places that I love. I, I um, uh, I'm also part <laughs> I'm part Italian and uh, Italy is one of my favourite places. <laughs> um, so I, I am desperate actually to, to have that somewhere in my books, although I haven't. Um, and I'm writing, uh, actually this is a little, little bit of an exclusive, but I am writing a, a book that's coming out this year that's going to be set partly in France. Um, and France has uh, is somewhere that I've travelled to and has had quite a big influence on me. So uh, that that's... I think I think wherever you go or wherever you travel, it does settings do have a big influence. So um, I think it's like, for example, for me, one of the, my biggest inspirations is music because I have two things. I'm extremely visual because I see I see what I'm writing happening in front of me. It's one of my big things. I see sort of I'm very much like it's a film. <laughs> That's how I see it, like a film, and I'm writing it down. I think having been a, I did some screenwriting as well. So having done screenwriting and, and writing plays, that's inevitable that I see books like that. And I also see it with a, uh, the music. So there's a lot of music in my books. So I think if you travel on top of that or, or where you, where you, what matters to you, like London or places that you know, um, the next series that will be, the big series that will be coming out, which will be very Rebel Werewolves, and that's going to be in autumn. Um, that's going to be set in Oxford, which is where I live. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be quite, um, that's good for me. That's going to be quite exciting for me, having it somewhere that I know. Definitely. What's the secret going from screenwriting, where there's a lot of blank spaces, to writing yeah. the novel and not overpowering the reader with details because you don't do that but you give a very vivid picture of you know what's going on where they are without getting into extreme details and I would think <laughs> coming from screenwriting you would want to do that so how did you make that balance I was always writing books at the same time just not doing anything with them <laughs> so um, I think because I was never passionate enough about, I mean, I was writing, but I was never, I could never decide what genre I wanted to go into, if I'm honest. So I was kind of writing books and thinking, yeah, but do I want to be writing crime for the rest of my life? Do I want to be writing historical fiction for the rest of my life? Because it's a little bit, once you start writing novels, you should ideally stick with what you're writing. Once you start getting known for one thing, that's what you do. And it was only once I um, had his voice going on and on in my head, which was light, which was the first verbal vampire book, and I was like, I have to write this, have to write this, that I knew actually this is something that I'm genuinely passionate enough to do, do something with. Um, so I was writing books. So I did have, I don't even know how many, I'd probably written about seven by the point I got to the book <laughs> that was published. So I had had that. But it is, there are, there are things like dialogue, which it really helps you with having a background in playwriting um, and dynamic between characters and and conflict. There are things that it really helps you with. And you're quite right that there are things that it is extremely different. Um, I think you sometimes have to just edit. <laughs> you write the first draft 
and then you come back on the after the first draft and you just you learn the art of editing and that's the stage that you go I, I haven't got my screenwriting on my playwright hat on right now I've got my novelist hat on and you get really brutal in the editing stage yes wow so going through the series as you were writing these five novels how much influence did your fans have over characters that would survive or how they developed later um it's a really really hard one i have some incredible fans they're called rosemary's rebels and one of them has just got a tattoo of the line um <laughs> kiss me hurt me burn me which is in the first book yes and uh they're, they're amazing um one of them um there's a rock band who's made songs based on it rebel angel song so i have some really incredible ones and they're really passionate about different characters so when you say well you know your favorite characters and then there'll be ones who are like rebel fans and ones who are mystery fans and, um so i always listen because you learn a lot <laughs> you learn a lot um but people you know things are subjective you know people compassionately love one thing that you're doing and people who passionately hate things <laughs> the same thing <laughs> so if you if you put too much into it into that you're not really being um you're not really being true to your vision and i'm a person who plots a lot so i knew the ending before i'd written the first book i knew exactly the arc i knew exactly where it was going i knew exactly what's happening so i didn't because I, I knew that I wouldn't be true to it. I was extremely nervous about reaction, but it was extremely good, so it was okay. Um, people, uh, the ending was what people, I wouldn't say the ending is what people wanted, because the, the ending was completely unexpected to people, but that's what I wanted. I'm always going to do the opposite of what people expect me to do, which is one of my rules in writing. Mm -hmm. Never go, never go for the expected, go for the completely pulling the rug out for people. That's what I do, um, but so far that's, that's that's working, so that's fine. But that's that's what I like to do because I'm a subversive writer, and uh, but but what it does have an influence in is when I write novellas or for box sets or when I think for who's going to be in spin-off series, because if there's been a particularly good reaction to certain characters, or I've, I get fan mail from people going, this this character changed my life for this reason, or this character um really matters to me for this reason then i think ah okay i could write a novella about that character or ah okay this one has had the most reaction from people maybe i'll maybe i will keep that one and move them over into another series so it really does it really does make a difference if people if i hear a lot of chatter about certain characters but think, not but not within it <laughs> right but i think that's true with fans they really love following it you never want it to end but how do you keep that a secret? If you know the ending ahead of time, five bucks ahead, how do you keep that a secret from your fans, <laughs> from your family, from you know somebody who could sell it to the media? How do you, you become like <laughs> you, you become like one of these spies? Like you know, I had my husband. My husband didn't even know. Like I didn't allow him to. Re I don't allow. I have a rule that I don't allow anyone to read it. The only time that my husband gets to read it is when the proof copy of the paperback comes free and then he gets to read it. And he's the only person that gets to, to read ahead of time. And then the art readers get it. But until that, no one does. So, yeah. Wow. And this is self-published, correct? Yes. It's, well, it's indie published because I have an indie company. But the reason I did that for my uh, novels, um, because I've been, I'm hybrid in the sense that I'm traditionally published for other things and I'm indie for this, is two reasons. One, that I have uh, an autistic son. And so uh, I decided for the novels, there was just no way I could do it. Uh, the scheduling and everything else traditionally published were traditionally published. Um, I needed control. I needed control over it. Um, and also what I wanted to write, um, so for example, in Rebel Vampires, the main vampire was inspired by my son because he's a, he's an audit, well, 
he's a savant and my son's a savant and I knew that because I know the traditional business well myself having been in it I knew what I was going to write was not going to be taken or if it was going to be taken purely on the basis of him being a savant they were going to want me to change that aspect because within it even I have a a vampire who's an autistic vampire and that was so important to me i thought now i want to get that into the mainstream why not have an autistic vampire why wouldn't they have turned him he's a prodigy um and so i thought no i'm gonna i'm gonna do this indie and i'm gonna make that mainstream and it's just like just like in this series i have a i have angels who have panic attacks for example <laughs> You know, you know, angels with anxiety. <laughs> you know, it's not angels who, in the second one, angels who have lost uh, their hands, who are essentially disabled and called imperfect because of it. You know, there's these actually really big issues, but ones that I know in mainstream books are, not, are very, very unusual. Um, and interestingly, the first series won, it won multiple awards and it hit bestseller lists and things. So I, I, I know that it was the right decision to do it, but uh, I didn't want to have what I was writing watered down. I thought it was too important. No, the series is definitely not watered down. And it <laughs> definitely has fantastic elements of all of those things, from handicaps to personality quirks it's a great read it's actually like this gripping page turner that you won't put down and it literally kept me up for two nights so thank <laughs> you and thanks for sharing so much about what you do and how you got the idea for the series it's amazing thank you oh my pleasure until next time keep asking questions and if you want a gripping page turner and you love vampires and maybe even angels that aren't so perfect, this is the perfect book for it. We'll see you soon.